what's up, everybody? It's Kurt the Arborist, and you're listening to the Arborist Blueprint Podcast. Today, we got Dirk Dornbos. Dornbos? Dorn, Dornbos? We'll ask him when he comes in. Uh, he's a rope access technician. He also owns his own company uh, that does rope access work for, for stuff. And uh, he's an inventor. He's invented stuff for rope access. Uh, so, yeah, total cool entrepreneur dude. He's awesome. Uh, he's also an assessor for rope access technicians. So like if you're looking to get into that industry, want to know what it's all about, the right path, everything, we're going to go through all of that with Dirk in this podcast. And most importantly, uh, we're going to talk about some of that transferable skill and overlap between a bore culture and rope access. We just released a three-part series with Sean Sterna about uh, how to be a contract climber or a contracting arborist you know, more independently without a lot of equipment and how to find work and all that kind of stuff. So head back to those episodes if you haven't listened to those. But if you're looking to get into this industry uh, because you love climbing, you want to climb in trees, you want to climb in whatever, in buildings, whatever, (laughs) this might be kind of cool. Maybe you can get your rope access uh, tech, you know, certification and all that kind of stuff as well. And you could be a rope access guy and you could be an arborist guy or girl or whatever. Okay. So anyways, uh, when Dirk pops in here, we're going to go through uh, what rope access is. He's going to explain it all for us, for us tree slayers and huggers. Uh, We're going to talk about some of that overlap, as I mentioned, uh, the training or education requirements, uh, which path to choose as you go through rope access. I think there's a few different organizations you can get certified with if, uh, if it's still the same as it was years ago when I first looked into it. Um, Just some different physical and mental considerations how to gain experience, get a mentorship uh, to get certified or to find work, and if that's appropriate, Uh, different career pathways and trajectories and advancement opportunities or special requirements maybe if you're thinking of starting up your own business. And uh, I'm hoping he can share some additional resources with us as well, how to get started if you're pumped right now, some different social media accounts, books to read, YouTube channels, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it should be great. We're going to let Dirk in here right now. Hey, Dirk. How's it going? Good to see you. Kurt, how are you, buddy? Good. We're Good to see you the, too. We're getting set up here. Look, check it out. Matching shirts. Yeah, I'll pretty play. funny that uh, you were intuitive. <laughs> I, I wore the this one in, instead of the obvious branding, uh, just to kind of break it up a bit. Yeah, for sure. We're gonna get into all that because you got you're kind of like me. You got lots of things going on. Uh, I sure do. Yeah. So, you know, from the outside looking in, which is why I didn't want to get too far into some of our chats, was uh, I have some organic questions around kind of like who you are, what you're doing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've already alluded to what's coming up in the episode, how we're going to go through uh, basically what rope access is and how to get into the career and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But before we go down that rabbit hole too far, can you tell us? who you are and your journey and what's going on? Yeah, my name's Dirk Dornboss. I've uh, been doing whatever it is that I do for a, a good long time, but I've been in the rope access industry for since, since the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I followed a pretty girl typical story over, over oh, yeah. to the UK and um, had, a, had a wonderful couple of years there. Um, got into rope access. Um, Kind of a, a bit of a means to an end. Uh, it was it was the climbing community uh, that, that I was in, mountain biking, um, outdoor community that we were in, and a lot of people were doing this rope access thing. And I had heard about it here and there, um, and I thought, man, that, what a cool way to make money. Mm. So, did my level one at the uh, in Clamberis in Wales, um, late two thousand or sorry, uh, late ninety nine. And uh, it was um, like October or something like that. So this clan the, the Brecon Beacon is is a is an old church. I don't know if it's still there, but um, super cold. Um, you know, Welsh countryside. Yeah, I've never been. Um, did my level one in, in that facility there, and uh, and the rest is kind of history. I ended up being a level two as well in the UK. Did my thousand hours, twelve months. And uh, while uh, during my time in the UK, I did end up being a level two. Uh, came back to Canada end of uh, end of two thousand two, something like that. Okay. And and I was I was just tired of the the UK cold. To be honest with you, it cold was rainy uh, or just like cold, cold and rainy. Yeah, it was the and climate. We got I want the rain odes too. 
right? You, we do. Yeah. Me and Dirk both have Ray nose, which is basically just where your fingers go ghost white as soon as it's cold out or you touch metal, which is not good. Well, and luckily, my, mine have only, mine only, they weren't getting me back then, but my, mine, you know, I'm 51 years old now and, you know, coming up on 52 here, Dude, you look, I guess, you next look good, October, like... but it's, it's like, it's only hit me with age. Uh, back back then, in those days, when I was getting tired of the winter uh, uh, UK winters, um, it, it wasn't that much of a thing. I actually, I, I always kind of attested it to a a, a bit of work I was doing um, up at Sunshine Village, uh, where it was it was really really cold. I was working very very hard uh, to out, outdoors um, doing snow removal on on uh, one of the the day lodge. Actually, yeah, it had some big roosters that and. I got a couple of people around to in safety, and I, I went off ropes to take off these things, and I was working really hard, and I, my my hands got frost nipped. Yeah, I think that's what time. happened to me too when I was a kid. It got just too really? cold a few yeah. times. Yeah, and I don't really know, but ever since then, man, and, and progressively, it's it's gotten worse. So, oh, but yeah. so so yeah, so but yeah, I got cold, got got tired of the UK cold, so came back. Okay. Um, Still friends with that one wonderful lady, of course, in the UK. Um, but uh, um, and then got back into Canada. And at the time, there was only one uh, industrial rope access um, uh, uh, trade association. So I ran a member company in Canada at the time. It was a remote access technology uh, operating out of Halifax. Um, and so I did a couple of trips out there to work for them uh, as a level two. And. Um, uh, Basically, you know, from then slowly they were they were starting to kind of break uh, themselves into the into the Western Canada market, oil and gas, and and that kind of thing, and just change it up from their offshore um, travel uh, rope access offerings traveling to Western Canada. Was there a big surge the with rope access? Just as a side rabbit hole here, but like with mm -hmm. all the oil and gas when that explosion was going on, was there mm -hmm. a big influx of rope access needs? More of a realization. And, oh, okay. and it's still happening, really. Um, you know, we have in, in the errata system, I think we're at somewhere around 250,000, 240,000 um, certified errata technicians globally with something like, I'd have to look it up exactly, but 70,000 active techs globally. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, but the, sur the surge and the realization of what rope access can do for commercial industrial um you know oil and gas is is still being realized hmm. um interesting that's kind of cool well it is and, it, and it's kind of a no-brainer you know like i've stuck with it because i love it I, I i get a kick out of it it keeps me fit i enjoy being on rope you know it's it's yeah. fun it's challenging new environments new people some of the jobs you're on you know it's it's um it's, it's just a ton of fun uh because of the guys and, and and i'm out of the field a lot you know more these days than than ever but uh so so that 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 ramp up of rope access industrial rope access being um an, a viable understood access method yeah. is is still happening really so you have so, your yeah own... at, at the oh sorry go ahead at the time, it, it was um, it, it was a bit of a boom, specifically in Canada for Irata member companies. Um, uh, so, so I, I traveled all over uh, Canada, a little bit in the U.S. Um, at, at during those days, and then the Western Canada Remote Access Technology uh, Office opened. I can't even remember when that would have been. Maybe, maybe like oh six, oh seven, oh five. I, I really something like that. Okay. And then. Um, and then I was one of the first few groups of, uh, or techs of uh, the first group of four, I think it was, we were like four or five techs on, on Syncrude's site, uh, whatever year that would have been. Um, and then, and then it's, uh, it's rolled from there. Now there's multiple companies on, on that particular site. But um, so yeah, so it's, it's still growing. But that, that was, that's kind of where I've come from. You know, I, I, I was a field technician as a level three for, you know, 10, 12 years. Uh, and then uh, 2011 to 15 kind of thing. I was the lean trainer for the same company. Uh, so it's so a training anywhere from 30 to 50 courses a year, um, okay. of which, um, which is really my passion. I enjoy the education side of things uh, more than almost anything. I mean, going out and doing large scale projects or even the small ones are, are, are pretty great as well. But you know, the connection of 
training, uh, you know, learning eight different personalities, you know, to, the material is almost non existent in, in education. You got to learn how to get through to eight different individuals, right. Uh, to yeah, absorb that's... this, this, this material. So I miss that interaction, but yeah, 30 to 50 courses, 30 to 40 courses a year, uh, over about five years. And, and, um, and then after that in 2014, I, I became a, an errata assessor. Um, and, uh, so I, so I, now I, I primarily, uh, instead of instructing, I, I mostly just go out on Friday and Saturdays and, and I assess, um, I, I, I assess competency, the level of competency of, of, uh, climbers, um, so that's in the you system. contracting uh, yourself to those mm -hmm. organizations to be an assessor, right? As opposed um, to like I, this company you were working for. Yeah, that's, that's right. So I come in as a third party assessor okay. to, uh, to test, uh, the level of competency of, of, uh, I rather level ones, twos and threes, gotcha. um, after they've had a week of, of training. Okay. Um, what yeah. about your business? So you said you were working for a different business as a field tech level three and excuse me, I don't know all of the, uh, terminology and uh stuff like that so mm -hmm. if i'm a bit confused that way uh just you know correct me but you mentioned you were a trainer for this company so you were quite involved which company mm -hmm. was that can you do you want to let us yeah are they still that around was remote access technology turned into uh kind of merged with uh Acurin. um so that, that's name specific i don't mind sharing that everybody knows anyway it's it's all good but you know that has an Acurin has now uh, tr uh turned into tactin and i've been away from them for quite quite a number of years now of course but uh the bulk of my training uh years were with them uh all across canada so what made you want to or what is the name of your business your rope access business so I personally have um, two companies, actually. One's Access Anywhere, uh, nice. Training okay. and Solutions. Uh, I do not do training uh, <laughs> in the IRATA, IRATA system, obviously, within that company. But I am uh, I, I mostly just consult uh, and assess through that company. Okay. Uh, so, and then my other company is, is this one here, uh, Rope, Rope's Edge. Um, Rope's Edge. It, yeah, Ropes Edge Equipment Company, which which is kind of in in the in the evolution and trajectory of what I do, kind of what I'm doing now. Um, and I do also hold a hold a job as well. So, Access Anywhere Training and Solutions primarily is just consulting. I haven't been taking on consultants for a couple of years since I got involved with this one company that has now turned into actually a job. But uh, consulting for cons for who? For for companies wanting to become an IRATA member. So the Industrial Rope okay. Access Trade Association um, has membership, um, and it takes a bit to to get um, to put membership in place. So, so companies call me uh, to, or other people. There's a couple in the UK uh, to to come in and help them uh, achieve membership. Oh, okay. So it's a quite a process yeah. of uh, different credentials. And so I have that on our list of things to chat about later. So maybe we can get into that mm -hmm. a little bit more then. Mm -hmm. But just so yeah. uh, I'm clear, I thought you had a business. Like where you actually do rope, act, like you have employees and you do rope access work, like window washing or whatever. Do well, you? No, that's that, that that side of Access Anywhere. So Access Anywhere does consulting, I, which is assessing, and then I do take on projects uh, when they come up. But I haven't uh, in the past number of <clears throat> years really chased operational projects. Okay. Um, I I more if people are around, if I get a call. Um, and people are around like the manpower and I have the time, uh, myself, I absolutely like, I've got two, two or three clients that do call on me once or twice a year for small things and, okay. and I keep them happy. I, I facilitate w what their needs are. And then, uh, so you'll so, find so guys and they'll contract to you and then you run it under access anywhere. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And then rope says is your. Yeah, and Rope's Edge um, is is the equipment side of things. So so that one kind of came about um, as a as a way to stay home. Really, you know, five six years ago, I started kind of thinking about uh, what um, what I could do to not travel for work. Uh, as as we all know, rope access is um, it's a lot of travel. Uh, same maybe tree. You know, your your industry 
Um, it, it's probably a bit of travel, but you know, it's a lot of in-town stuff too. But industrial rope access kind of demands you to uh, leave for industrial work anyway. The local window cleaning jobs are more in the city, but I've avoided that. Yeah. Um, because I didn't really want to be in the city. Now I'm in Cochrane these days, um, so maybe at some point that'll that'll happen. But um, so yeah, so I was I was traveling a lot for work, but I I just got sick of it, you know, really. So. I kind of thought, you know, what, you know, what am I going to do, but still be a part of this industry that I love so much. Um, right. And so I kind of came up with a, a couple of things. Um, you can kind of see them over here. But the uh, and this is sure how most hang up my... arborists know you, I think, is through uh, Rope's Edge. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, because we and and that's what I want to talk about too. There, Kurt, is is our history. Um, you know when. This this is one of them, but yeah, I, I kind of came up with. Right, uh, that's how I met you. That thing. And, and yeah, and that's that's where we first connected, wasn't it? We I was. Is that Arborist Supply? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, near Calgary area here, and then you had come in, and we're mm -hmm. talking about some inventions and stuff. That's the first time I'd ever heard of rope access, and it's like, mm -hmm. well, this dude's like inventing stuff for his industry. Mm -hmm. That's cool. <laughs> well, trying to anyway, you know, it's it's um, yeah, I still don't know what I'm doing five, six, seven years into it here, but uh, I'm I'm sure giving it a go. People are responding well, um, and and you know, like anything, you know, there's room for improvement in these products that we use. Now, I'm no big business person, not not yet what Rope's Edge is anyway, so I don't have access to you know, a hundred thousand dollar you know, bankrolls for certification and all this. So, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of just, just achieving, I'm, I'm, I'm creating products and for applications that I, I can reach that I can right. get to. Um, and the vortex goes through grading and you put your, your rope into it and you, uh, you, you then get a, a softened edge basically. And that's an for going that, in like a graded floor. So if, if people are just listening and they can't see, it looks like it's this tool and, you can explain it as soon as I'm done messing it up, but <laughs> it looks like you put it through those graded floors and you can kind of screw it in from the bottom to the top and the top of it is like this uh, black hole of a smooth s spherical kind of edge that a rope can go through. So it can go in from 360 dire degree direction around and then down mm -hmm. through this hole without rubbing up against a hard metal edge. Would that be sort of how you would describe that's perfect. it? perfect. That's, that's about it. Yeah. So it goes into the grading. That's exactly right. It fits in, uh, you know, three to, uh, uh, so one inch, uh, one inch in width and then in the grading in the, in the Kennedy grading that is, uh, three to five inches in, in length here that's and then cool. one inch wide and, and it goes in and then you turn it and then it, the purchase happens on the bottom side. Uh, the, the T chant, the T, uh, tiers, there's three of them. You turn it and then you, clamp it down okay that's an asmr right there. maybe yeah are you hearing that awesome <laughs> yeah interesting well this one is actually one of the original prototypes it's on the shelf with the patent over there it just kind of sits on display so it might feel or hear or sound a little bit uh rough uh so it's, it's not a new uh version do you ever just walk around your place like with that thing around like a big chain around your neck like with no shirt on and look <laughs> at yourself in the mirror or like i do not should i oh well i find you know it might pump you up a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> some some, uh, some <laughs> training. <laughs> well, for inspiration, I mean, I know what you mean. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no doubt that um, I do hold them in my hand. And uh, I mean, th this here uh, is uh, the next evolution of things, and and it's made out of metal. So, so what I oh, landed cool. on for the vortex, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the Coles notes here, so I'm not boring everyone too much. But it's it's. When when I started looking at, um, I brought in an engineering firm, so I had it, you know, professionally engineered for strengths and limitations, stuff like that, material density, um, feasibility studies on the computer, just to see if this was going to work at all. And then we we sent it away for uh, prototyping um, it to the U.S. Um, for for three D printing, um, and uh, we I don't know we did like six or seven of those that way. Um, and then I'm like, man, you know what? I'm going to test one of these prototypes. Um, and, and it, in, in the material and the version, the PA 12 nylon that we use, it went really, really well. And the testing gave us about an eight to one safety factor. So a factor of safety of eight. 
okay. that was better than expected. This particular version that I showed you, that this is um, not PA12 nylon. So th this would actually like with, th this this is quite brittle of a material. Brittle, uh, so, like if it gets so, cold, it could shatter? E e or? Even as it is, okay. but cheap to use for prototyping. Uh, right. Really easy to prototype, inexpensive, uh, not manufacturing uh, level uh, material. Um, so the 3D printing result on the PA12 nylon uh, vortex went so well, um, and then the the avenue to injection molding uh, it, it, it came down to money and resources for me. Um, an 81 safety factor of safety is is when you consider if we if we uh, give one human being on rope uh, one kilonewton of force. Um, you know, I've got eight kilonewtons of force before the vortex fails. Right. Okay. So a lot of our product is like, uh, you know, 10 to one for its working load mm -hmm. limits and that sort of thing. Yeah. There's and so and this isn't it. even an engineered or rated device. So given that the factor of safety is eight, you know, there's no certifications in edge management. There may be someday I have looked at it, uh, to maybe kind of start that process to oh, be okay. the one that kind of initiates it. Yeah. But the reality of edge management, and, and this is a, a podcast in itself that maybe we could do, but it, it, the uh, edge management, the variables are just too vast and varied to put a standard requirement on edge management. Because even though this is a, you know, this applies, that this applies to certain types of Kennedy grading, edge management solutions or edge management systems or edge management requirements are so variable. Yeah, you can't say it must be this, this, or this. Um, there's just too much to involved, and that's why there isn't really the way I understand it anyway. But um, yeah, so that factor of safety at eight, even though yes, we know you know carabiners are five to one uh, at least. You know, hard goods, soft goods are generally ten to one with slings. Um, this eight to one for a non-certified non-standardized piece of equipment i was pretty happy with cool um and, and for my own understanding and and indus industrial understanding of of material and product and how it should be used as well used in the right way you'll never ever ever reach um those kind of failures or those kind of forces on the material or product so i was happy with it so i, w I went with it and um and avoided the injection molding side of things which is you know, anywhere from twenty to forty to sixty to a hundred thousand dollars of investment to make the mold, um, and then tens and twenty thousand dollars of investment to 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 um, refine the mold. Uh, so so I chose to avoid all of that investment and just prove the concept. And I've been able to prove the concept over these years, yeah. uh, and 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 also learn. Uh, from my own mistakes, um, which is probably more than my successes, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it's it's been great. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. Like, I'm just kind of stepping back and looking at this from a broader view of like your mindset and things. You know, you're kind of an expert in your industry as far as you know going through the different certifications, reaching the highest level, becoming an assessor, you know, being an advocate for the industry, all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of a similar trajectory people can take in bore culture as well you know starting from the ground up like literally and then starting a business and whatever and and there are arborists out there that are um innovating some products because i think i don't know if it's similarities between a bore culture and rope access that they're they're sort of like unique and like a lot of the people maybe maybe it's the same as every industry i don't know but like a lot of people that are in the industry using the stuff are the ones coming up with new ideas and how to change it and there's a lot more flexibility maybe because it is small compared to major government run organizations i don't know but mm -hmm. there, it's one thing to like be an arborist and then it's one thing to start a business and run a tree company or a rope access mm -hmm. company doing work. But then it's got to be a completely different thing, like trying to do innovation and invent a new product. Like that's that's a whole thing in itself. Like you're, it's not like a normal business. Well, so how do you it, go, it is, how do you do that? I have no idea. You just you talk to people, you ask <laughs> questions, and you just keep going with what what happens. But I think you're right. But one of the reasons why I'm I'm carrying on with this, and and it's been it's been relatively successful, and it's building a brand. And it, but but you just said it yourself. In in your industry of arbor culture, you're the guys. You, you're you're the one using the tool. 
Yeah. You you know how you want it to work. You know, like the reason why I came up with this is because nothing else like it existed. Everything else you needed a big old heavy wrench or but, it weighed yeah. two and a half pounds and it was on your harness. This this weighs barely eight ounces a piece. Like but it, lots it, of people it have ideas, you know, but yeah. how do you where do you even start? Like, I mean, I guess paper and pen, you start drawing out what something like this would look like. And then, but where mm -hmm. do you go from there? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what are the steps? Talk like, to you, an engineer, do you get I help think. Getting design or do you have a, do you yeah, get yourself? Yeah, or? well, yeah. And, and, um, and, and d despite my best uh, attempts, um, I'm, I'm no CAD designer. So I need to bring, I have, I have people that I use for these things, right? So, so for CAD, um, you know, I, different contractors for different updates but you know you get yourself a patent lawyer uh to involve those people to make sure you're doing it right as well um you know you can apply for your own patent but that's it's it's a thing man um it's a thing to do and and put down the money have your meetings get it right on paper get the submission right because you you know you don't want to be backing out of of, of all that time and effort especially if you have something that you think anyway is a real solution for in, my, my whole mission and motto is increase safety and increase efficiency because if you're not safe and you're not efficient you know you're gonna have mistakes and then all the other variables are gonna are gonna come down so you know get yourself a patent lawyer talk to an engineer um, get the people involved for for wherever you're lacking in skills you know what are your skills lacking right I can't draw cat I'm not a computer guy you know, yeah. aside from, you know, even, even, well, it, you, you, you can put our technical difficulties at the beginning of this call. Like <laughs> I, I can figure Blooper it out. Blooper real. Even, yeah, exactly. You know, but at the same, yeah. So bring in the right people, I would say, you know, um, okay. go, go right to the resource. If you have ideas, you know, that's the other thing is, and I think you're right. I'm seeing more of this as well in the rope access industry, people coming to me with ideas because the technology is more accessible. Yeah, Speci specifically with 3D printing and prototyping, it's it's just a totally different thing these days. Yeah, I love the idea of uh, this crossover between these two things, which we can kind of touch on here. But um, mm -hmm. when you see things from rope access and that industry and how people are doing things, like when I was talking to Sean, uh, mm -hmm. you can take some of those some of those tools or some of those ideas and bring them over to bar culture because it's like mm -hmm. it's almost like these different industries kind of created themselves or from somewhere but they didn't always just talk to each other and now there's a lot of crossover with people and maybe it's with you know social media all this kind of different stuff that people are getting new ideas on how to use these things or well, go that's about true. their industry and rope rescue uh arboriculture rope access technical rope rescue uh, all of these things use a very um similar uh tool system based on friction products friction devices you know, progress capture, uh, pulleys, rope, you know, rope, current mantle rope. Yeah. And, and the crossover is immense. And we're really like, like you mentioned, Sean, and, and, uh, you know, these guys are, I think you at, do you have one of my foot loops, you know, like yep. the, the, the foot loop that we use for us that I, that we make for ropes edge, uh, it's gone beyond. I've got eight, eight or nine products out there. Now, one of them is the infinite loop where it applies to us sending ropes for an arborist if, if you use it that way or if or if you need it that way because there's other techniques that are coming that, that apply like aid climbing that apply to arboriculture if you just want to make a point over here and then step in that point you you can right so yeah there's a lot of crossover and that's just my stuff I mean descent control devices actually like the zigzag or the rope wrench or all these things that you guys use I've been attracted to those and I've never for a long time I've been I've been fascinated by them and I'm, I'm like how is he doing that in the tree well like that totally applies to rope access why are we not using this and now that's a standards and and certifications reason of course but yeah the application and use of that yeah you know, uh, what, do, what do you call it what's a zigzag it's a um, like a like a mechanical friction device or mechanical prusik yeah that's mechanical right prusik, yeah. Um, it applies to rope access so that there is right. was there both massive... throwing ropes into places the anchor mm -hmm. points are different one's a tree one's you know something else maybe we yeah. should go back now and we'll kind of get mm -hmm. started on the uh bit of the structured part here for people mm -hmm. now that we've probably thoroughly confused everyone with inventions <laughs> of things and rope access we went right to the extreme but let's go back to uh mm. 
being a rope access technician, if you could explain, like, what is rope access from a basic level? Like, where's yeah. the need for it um, for us, you know, tree slayers, tree huggers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what is a rope access technician? Well, it's a, it's a it's an individual uh, that has a certification typically, not always, uh, but typically I strongly advise that you do go get a certification, typically uh, getting certified as a brand new level one, whether it, you're in, in North America, uh, the SPRAT system or the IRATA system. It's generally typically a four or a five day course with one day of, of assessment or evaluation. Um, and then between levels, uh, you need different hours uh, for each system, you have different amounts of hours um, that you need to go and achieve in the field under under supervision, okay. and um, and then and then you can go back and do do your next level of certification. Um, but typically, you're uh, you know as a level one, you it's it's the entry level. You can come in as a totally green guy, uh, no understanding, no knowledge, no no background. Uh, maybe you did some indoor rock climbing. Similar Before. to like apprenticeship where you could come in green, do do the first course or first amount of in-class sort of training before you can go out mm-hmm. and then start getting some hours. So like what, like other than, I'm sure people generally know, but obviously we're accessing areas with rope. So if you're, if it's in a tree, you're an arborist, but like mm-hmm. what kind of jobs are like the general things that people are doing where they would require and rope access yeah. te- technician, like what would you be? doing kind of day-to-day as a rope access tech it's um all sorts of things that need difficult access um achieved for a task um one thing that i always say if i'm if i'm explaining it to somebody that has no idea uh what rope access is i yeah. say you ever seen the window cleaners yeah it's basically that um obviously there's more to it but it's essentially that but when they got to clean typically- a window and how the heck are they going to do it they need to be on a rope and swing stage, uh, crane basket. There are ways, uh, hundred foot man lift. Um, but r- typically industrial rope access, it takes you, you know, minutes to, to rig ropes as opposed to, you know, obviously there's a safety plan, of course, that goes in preliminary, like to anything, but, um, and there is of course with a man lift or, 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 um, swing stage there's always a safety plan it should be anyway um but rope access is just incredibly efficient in by comparison in, right in time so, and, and safety the safety statistics are just night and day you know one thing that i used to say and, and scaffolders all, all apologize now if this statistic is ancient but because it very well may be but one thing that i used to say you know i'm, I'm obviously an advocate for rope access but industrial rope access is statistically safer than any work at height method out there uh, for redundancy and action and, and, you know, just stats all around. Um, you know, scaffolders, I used to say, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I used to, because it was a real stat at the time, you know, this is when I was training, uh, you know, 60 people in the, in, the, in the scaffolding industry would die each year just in North America alone. And please get, you know, get at us in the comments, put, put uh, correct to me if, uh, if that's not right anymore. Um, but typically, you know, education certification is just very, very different between them. Hmm. Between scaffolding and rope access. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know you had to have certification to be in scaffolding. I just assumed you, once you build the the structure, you can just go up there. Yeah, no. Um, it's, it's part of the carpenter, um, red seal becoming a carpenter. Okay. Yeah. So other than window washing, what are some common things? I know Sean said that he works for uh valor rescue there a bit so then when there's mm-hmm. emergencies like uh whatever something sprung a leak in some building and it was up behind a wall where you couldn't really get to it with a ladder or anything so then they mm-hmm. had to sh- find anchor points and shimmy out there with their ropes and you know uh access it that way mm-hmm. which i find is also interesting as an aside is that when you're rope access tech you're trained to like access and get there but then when you get yeah. there it's like Okay, all of a sudden, are you like a jack of all trades where it's like you understand how like structures are built sort of. and drywall and, and so, you know, tearing stuff up and then, or are you just like recording and like talking back to people of what you're seeing and what's going on and taking video and, mm-hmm. you know, because you, you must have to, or there'd be a lot of benefits to having to know, understand and know a lot about other things and just how to get there. 
Well, exactly. And, and that was actually a part of the growth um, in North America. And we still see this, pro this as an issue, but we marry tradesmen nowadays with rope access. So if you're a pipe fitter, you're an electrician, you're mm. a welder, you go get your access ticket. Uh, similar to if you're a pipe fitter, uh, a welder or, or whatever, you can go get a fall arrest ticket because fall arrest is the access. Right. Um, stuff like that. But um, in the day and, and kind of sort of still now in the commercial sector of things, um, you know, it's, you know, the requirement on, on oil and gas sites is much more stringent. Uh, black and white, red seal. You gotta, you gotta have the tradesmen on site. Um, I'm not by any means saying that you know, rope access technicians will go there and just work on high voltage. You bring in the right people, right? Yeah. Um, but but back in the day, that was it. You're a jack of all trades. You know, you get called in for the building maintenance, for the windows, for 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 changing the light bulb, uh, for caulking and sealing. Uh, you know, for mortar. Uh, in in the brick, you know, concrete repair, all all these different things, and now your company's building maintenance, building repair, so you can kind of capture these things. Right. So should so. I think of rope access um, in two mm -hmm. different ways? It seems like it can be an additional kind of like ticket, you know, or certification mm -hmm. that you can add on to an existing trade or something you're already doing to kind mm -hmm. of complement it and maybe get higher earnings, whatever, give you more opportunities, or and this may depend on what level you get, but it sounds like you mm -hmm. can also do rope access as like a, a full-time job. So if you're a window washer, I mean, do you consider yourself a rope access tech? That's my job, or am I a window washer that has rope access? I mean. It depends on your career path, and I think you're right. That's exactly how I have to view it. I mean, like a lot of, a lot of the up north uh, companies that provide rope access as a service within their, you know, you know multi, you know, they, they offer all sorts of different trades. Um, they give, new technicians or level one technicians or current trade technicians um, the option to focus on say, say they come in and, and they're a level one with no trade they just got a, a rope access certification because their friend had it and they're like you should do this yeah but now they go in with uh, an inspection company and then there's they incentivize it to to stay a level one or maybe become a level two rope access um, but go down the inspection route. So then you go get, they will help you get your inspection tickets. Um, or, so now, you know, you focus on the on on the inspection trade. Or for me, I, I went down the inspection route a, a little bit for a couple of years, um, but I, I primarily just, I'm, I'm a rope guy. That, that's that's my knowledge, understanding, passion, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, through 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 life, that's just kind of where, where I landed um, and it, you know, it's, it's just different nowadays. Uh, we marry rope access, like uh, rope access is the access method. And, and then we bring in the trades. Right. Uh, and some, cool. sometimes we even put uh, non-certified rope access technicians, or sorry, non-certified trades on rope with direct supervision. That's also an acceptable practice with direct supervision. Uh, you can work with somebody, you know, side by side. Which would be a great way to, to get the inspector in, into place. Yeah, for sure. That'd be a, like an awesome way to learn and expand on what you're doing. Like if you want to dabble and get into rope access and start working, mm -hmm. you could kind of choose, I guess, what sort of company you work for, what sort of things they're doing, whether it's like inspections for like restoration in Calgary or you want to go work up in a camp and mm -hmm. put in a bunch of time doing regular projects. Maybe they're building something. I don't know, but you can... Uh, definitely get a taste for some of those other things or if you already have mm -hmm. some background and skill interest in something maybe you can marry rope access to that mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah go ahead or or i was listening to you guys last night you and sean i was kind of catching up with your i was seeing your format and you know i wanted to kind of do my research so while i was doing some of the uh some work like later last night i was listening to you and sean or or be a contract climber right like that's yeah. basically what what i was for a very long time i primarily contracted to the one company i went to work for them as an employee then obviously when i was a trainer uh you know i, I stayed with with the one company for a good long time um but the way sean, sean's approach um is, is is interesting it's great like he's contract arbor guy con you know contract rope access and to rope rescue as well with valor um so many what what whatever direction you want to go with it you really can because it's your certification you upkeep the certification yeah. you maintain it um and and you dive as deep as you want into the certification or into the industry 
you know, do you want to develop gear? Do you want to teach? Do you want to do a podcast? Do you want to, or do you want to just yeah. go to work, do your thing, do your two week ro rotation and then just come home? How Which do you I wanna... think you have to do first, like, like any of these careers, you kind of get into it, you get a taste for it. You get a mentor, you get your training, then you get your hours. You see some different things, get experience maybe from a variety of those things. And then mm -hmm. at some point you're like, well, I can start teaching people. And it becomes so comfortable that you start to, I think, enjoy teaching. So then that opens up those new opportunities. And it's like, okay, well, if I can teach, I could be a trainer. I could be an assessor like you. Exactly. You can start a podcast. You can just kind of use your creativity to kind of push mm -hmm. your own career and where you want to go or diversify like Sean. I mean, he has an interest in firefighting and he's a, a volunteer firefighter. Well, I think they're, they're pretty well paid on call and stuff now because it's getting so, so much busier. But then his rope access is influencing the fire department that he's at. So I'm sure they have a really mm -hmm. strong rope uh, rescue like program and equipment and training that they do mm -hmm. through Sean. And the fire well, he, side he mentioned, like, influences he, him. Totally. And, and you're absolutely right. By his rope access career, that particular fire department that he's with or ones that I've come into contact with, they are all, and, and again, Get at me for my corrections, but my trend, the, my observation in the trend, uh, they're going away from the 13 and 15 mil single rope technique, prussics everywhere, uh, to uh, two rope system, 11 mil rope yeah. access, um, which is interesting to me. Uh, you know, some some of the some of the departments are sending their guys for certification, whether it's Sprat or Irata here in North America. Um, so some are not, um, some are sticking with NFPA, but task force two as well. Um, you know, I, I help them kind of develop their, like here in Calgary, yeah. uh, their rope access, you know, procedures for how they teach and train oh, okay. it and understand it and adopt it into what they're doing. Cause they've co completely come away from, uh, any of the single rope, 13, 15 mil stuff and, and gone to a two rope system. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That might be cool to have someone from Rope uh, Task Force 2 on here. I mean, like mm -hmm. Johnny or Neil, yep. if people know them from the arboriculture industry. But that's a cool place to work or to be a part of because they're not just like having, as far as I know, like just rope access guys over here. Then there's like this arborist over here. Then there's this search and rescue guy over here. It's like they're taking everything from the industries and getting a lot of these guys that are cross-trained already in a variety mm -hmm. of these disciplines and, and they need that together. for that they and they need that because you know they they yeah they absolutely do need that because mm -hmm. they need that that breadth of experience they need the they need guys to be trained up on all of the modules that they they need to have as a rescue as task force too i mean like that's disaster management they they do some big projects and big disaster relief um management so uh yeah mm -hmm. yeah if yeah, anybody doesn't know Canada, task force two is uh like an emergency response unit I, b I believe you volunteer to be on it you need like a variety of skills that are in need to them and then natural disasters that occur all over the world they'll mm -hmm. deploy to and then it's a variety of different skill sets and tools and things like that they'd have for natural disasters like earthquakes or floods mm -hmm. or you know yeah. huge fires whatever whatever it might be so they need all that different types of training but yeah yeah so um as far as uh training and education you mentioned there's like three different levels um, mm -hmm. what are, what are those levels and like, what are the limitations of each? Like, what can you do with each one? Like, how are they different? Typically, uh, level ones are viewed as the worker. Um, but you know, I always like to say you're never just a level one because a lot of people will enter rope access with a completely different set of life skills and experiences beforehand. Um, some came in green with zero, um, and some have already been you know, a recreational rock climber or in task force, say, or other smaller fire departments, rope rescue courses previous. So their knowledge base coming in as just a level one is friggin' beyond even some level threes that we see. Right. Um, so typically though, uh, in, in either a Sprat or a Rata system, the level one's the worker. Uh, they, they can rig ropes with supervision. They can work on rope with supervision, direct supervision. Um, so you can't be and independent then, as a as a level one. You have to be with at least a level two or a level three. In the errata system, you always need to whether you're le whatever level you are are even a level three. If you're working for an errata member company, you never work alone. That's, okay, that's the that's kind of a big one. Uh, level ones are under the direct supervision um, and you know <laughs> of, of level three as well. Uh, so there's always two people on site. So errata. Uh, Sprat's a little different, and, and I've been out of the Sprat game directly. For I am still a Sprat level three myself. Um, 
but and, and things have changed and improved like immensely over the past four or five years with Sprat and the and the system has got so much better um so so it's different so so again get at us in the comments and, and correct me if i'm wrong here but it's it's a little bit different but a, a level two can be a supervisor um and and level it's it's they're almost a mirrored system okay but not exactly with a couple of different maneuvers different rescue techniques level one sprat does a pick off from a chest to sender so if you're statically loaded in a tooth device um, that isn't a descent control device. A level one in the Sprat system can actually do that rescue as a Sprat level one. In the Arata system, we don't have that. Uh, we don't do a pickoff. We do, do a descent rescue only for a level one. So there are subtle differences, um, but as far as performance in the field or what you can do, uh, you know, level ones, both systems, direct supervision. Um, okay, and that's like a four to five day course, like you said, you can be green. What does that generally cost, like roughly for, to get that first level? And what, what would you need? I'm you also buy out of touch equipment? with that, but um, it's in, yeah, so that's two parts. So, so cost for the course is different across Canada uh, okay. and the US uh, and the UK and Australia. So, um, but typically in Canada, it can be 1700 to 22. Okay. From what I've noticed. Just as an um, idea. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, like I'll, I'll just say that you get what you pay for. Um, if, if it's a discounted, I mean, I don't know that that's, that's, that's me anyway, but In general, um, yeah. Do you need to buy mm -hmm. any equipment yourself then too? Like, is there any other costs other than, you know, traveling and being there, that kind of thing, but no, for the course, when you go, uh, the, the, com uh, like the training member company, uh, whoever's the Sprat or the Irata, uh, typically, uh, provide the gear. Okay. And then you can work mm -hmm. under supervision. So then how many hours again do you need after generally? For the level I'm gonna one. have to look up the Sprout one. I'm pretty sure it's still 500 be between each levels, though I don't think I've ever heard uh, of a recent change on that one. No worries. Um, and then level two. Uh, at, uh, 500 hours between levels for Sprat, and then 1,000 hours between each level for uh, Rata. So let, let me just actually re repeat that because there's a bit more to it. Okay. Uh, so 500 hours and six months for Sprat between levels, 1,000 hours and 12 months time uh, for Irata. So even, even if you, even okay. if at 10 months you hit 1200 hours, which your average typical person working an eight hour day, um, 1500 hours a year kind of thing, it would be pretty hard to achieve on rope because rope time for your log book isn't exactly your eight hour day. Okay. So is it yeah, actually so, rope time you're recording? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. So uh, yeah, you're going to be doing a lot of jobs. Because you could be standing around traveling these jobs where you're getting paid as an employee, but you're not actually on rope doing. That's right. So, so for loggable, for hours. loggable hours in a log book, it's time on typically anyway. Time on rope, time being supervised, time being a part of the the safety paperwork. So, so planning and management, uh, or um, uh, equipment inspection. Okay. And, uh, and again, I, I'm a tiny bit away from the Sprat system, but I'm fairly sure it's about the same. No worries. Okay. Uh, level two. What are we looking yeah, at there? I'll, back to school? Back to school, the required four days training uh, for, um, so, so that's actually a difference between Sprat and Irata. And again, I, I, I should have actually done some Sprat research before this. Um, but the uh, Irata system requires you to take four days. Um, Sprat, I think they've uh, changed, made some changes to where, towards the required training, but I don't think that starts until level two. Um, I could be wrong about that though. But uh, yeah, so a level two, uh, uh, six months, 500 hours, uh, and then in Sprat, and Irata is 12 months, uh, 1,000 hours. Again, so basically it is a repeat. And those yeah. things you're learning when you go back to the school that are just the next level advanced techniques mm -hmm. that you weren't allowed to use when you were level one, but once you're level two, you can start to use those, is that? Fair yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, as as I said, so as a level one, either system, you're 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 typically just the worker. So you're only learning how to be on rope, because a lot of people don't understand. You like like being on rope on assessments. What one of the things that I often say and I bring up, and and the whole class is just going aha moment, is training and assessment is very different to what you're going to find in the field. Once you go to the field, you're going to have earmuffs, PPE, glasses. You know, bigger helmet, a balaclava, gloves, frozen fingertips, um, other noise, 
you know, other safety, you know, other people and workers, snow, rain, all sorts of other things. Uh, so on assessment day, if you can't do it in, in, in the gym on assessment day where it's warm, dry, quiet, very right. simple, easy, easy Control instructions. Environment. Controlled environment. Um, you can't really do it um, out in the field. So. Yeah, that's a good uh, mindset to have, I guess, too, as an assessor, because you, when you're on that kind of gray line of like, should I pass this guy? Should I not? I don't know. You got to consider that a bit too, like as to. Well. If they're struggling. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that because I don't pass people. I don't fail okay. people. They they pass or fail themselves. That's you know, right. When you're doing this, you know, it's, get your shit you know, to get stuff together. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's really got nothing to do with me. I just I just, I'm just there to verify skills, yeah. to to verify competency, right? So I'm just a verifier. You're more and, objective and this, than subjective. You have to be. Y yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, level three. Same thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. So level three, both systems. You're kind of the, typically the supervisor. Uh, Arata has been working on uh, supervision, a supervision certification. Okay. Uh, that'll be coming out one day uh, uh sprat I'm, I'm not really sure but typically what's happened is is as you become a, a brand new level three in either organization you're, you're typically the one running the job okay so you're overseeing the entire project you're working with the operations manager to set up uh this the safety pick to have a job plan the method statement make sure everything's compliant you got inspected equipment stuff like that um and uh and and you you know, you're supervising, you're managing people, you're, you're taking care of a team of people and keeping them safe. And you're ultimately responsible for them. Um, accountability is a big part of it. So, you, you know, you got to manage a team, you got to manage individuals, um, make sure that the variables aren't getting in the way. Are they stressed? Are they rushed? Do we have the gear or the edge pro <laughs> that's on hand? Do we have what we need? Or do we have just a spattering of randoms that don't really ap apply to this project, right? Uh, so make sure your team is making good decisions. Um, so you're overse overseeing a good amount of things. Even though even though technicians are, are meant to be certified, yeah. and typically you are managing a crew of certified individuals, not all level ones, not all level twos, and not all level threes are created equal, even through the CD certification process. Uh, and, and I imagine that ARB is, is the is the same thing. Yeah, if there's um, any qualifications to be an arborist, there's not mm -hmm. really it's so different. Yeah, but yeah. So going to that third level, uh, back to school, because you mentioned a lot of it about supervision and mm -hmm. leadership and taking care of other people. Is that what the training is actually focused on? Like how to be a leader, how to connect with people, and all that kind of stuff. No, or but, is but it the new just skills again. That's right, and, and yeah, that's been the shortfall over the years. And and I and I hope some uh, rope access people actually hear this as well and and have a little bit of um, uh, aha moments because that that's been the problem, right? Not all level three supervisors are are built to supervise. Right. So now you now you got a twenty one year old kid. Some twenty one year old people are are mature and and up for the task. I've I've worked with them myself and and watched them then progress into upper management at nowadays they're 35 or 38 years old family and they've done very well um but but it's you know 21 year old person you're kind of distracted um so so not yeah. life experience so, comes into it too like, that's it. it it does yeah where have you actually been so, so that is the, hard to define it, 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 it that, that's kind of the variable that's hard to define it's a little bit of a random one but to answer your question more specifically um it's all rope rescues you do not get a heavy focus on actual management aside from build the safety paperwork you know put put in you know do a risk assessment you know build in bring get the gear that you need uh build the team that you need with the competent personnel or trades uh that you need for you know because some level twos that did a bunch of rescue on training have gone and done geo work who have a very different um amount of hours in their logbook than uh, the window cleaner that was also a level two. So his, uh, you know, exposure to actual rescue and skills and, and rope work and rope management um, is, is just a very different thing. So you're going to choose a different type of level two to build, a, to build a, a job for this oil and gas application. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, like the fire department and just so many things that kind of mm -hmm. driving nuts is that 
you know, you're put into these positions of leadership just based on like, oh, I took this course. So now all of mm -hmm. a sudden you're like the supervisor because you went through that course. But just because you academically went through a course and got some hours doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean you know how to lead. You know, mm -hmm. you have to help people get out of jams, how to communicate with those people, all these skills that mm -hmm. leaders have. And there's no like leadership component to it. And, and I, I give credit to Arboriculture Canada. You know, they're mm -hmm. a private school, so they can be a little more hands-on. It's kind of what they want. They can follow their own visions of what they've built. Um, being an, uh, an arborist school, uh, if anybody hasn't heard of it, Arboriculture Canada Training and Education Limited. But they have a train the trainer program, right? Mm -hmm. And you go into that train the trainer program. When I showed up there. People thought it was like just a how to deliver the program to teach someone to do like a chainsaw safety course, hmm. you know, and then you could go. Up. But when they got there, it was like shocking because the whole course revolves around um, like some personal development stuff and like human connection, exposing your weaknesses, like all of that stuff that's like probably not in that level three sprat course, you know, all the stuff that's around being a good yeah. leader. Mm -hmm and all these different techniques and, and why they work. And it was, mm -hmm. it was so cool. And it was like, man, I wish everyone could take this course that ever has to do some sort of leaders, leadership position. Well, and I fully agree with you 110%. Um, and, and, you know, the errata system, I don't, uh, again, I'm not up on, on Sprat, but the errata system has had a small kick at the can. I'll, uh, I'll quote Lee Greenwood on that one. Uh, some, some that listen will know, uh, but he used to say, you know, it's a small kick at the can. Now we have an instructor certificate. Uh, so we have, you know, it used to be a level three could train on his own. He could just train a level one could train a level two could train. Um, you could just train rope access if you are a current certified rope access technician. Um, but now there's a requirement. If you're just, and again, not just a level three, but if you're interested in, in training, uh, you're allowed to, tr and you're a level three, no, no instructor cert, you can train up to four techs. If you have an instructor cert, you can train up to six technicians. If you're a level two, no instructor cert, um, there are numbers that apply to that as well. Okay, and you can only also just train the level that you are, and similar for a level one, only train the level that you are. Um, okay. Do you mean so, train like like you're the leader on a job? Is that what you're referring no. to? No. Like so this is this is training, training like actually training the course. Oh, okay. Like being so a, the, being no, a not, trainer to deliver a not course. Not operations. Material. That's right. So, okay. So yeah. So so it's a small kick at the can. So that's next for us as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, is how do you train? Because if you remember at the beginning, I said, figuring out how, you know, you got eight personalities in the room. You got your assistant trainer, so you got eight. So certified, you know, actually my, my instructor ticket is, is currently because I haven't been training, so, so it, it expires. Um, but um, so, so you have eight, right, as a lead trainer, uh, and you have your assistant there, and now you have eight people in front of you. The material is, you know, the, the skills and techniques and material, the methods that you're training and instructing almost take a back seat because you got to figure out how these guys learn. And that's where train yeah. the trainer programs or back to the supervisory, that's where management programs and management um, certifications come in or should come in. And the only way these things are implemented or brought in is when accidents occur or you know, whatever. And then yeah. uh, certificate, in certified. response to something, yeah, that mm -hmm. wasn't predicted, although yeah. I mean, it could have been. Yeah. Especially if you look at other industries and how other people do things and how they find successes. I don't know why we don't model these things in other, in other areas. I think it's just also well, that, a huge volume of people and so many people in the, in the cogs of the wheel that. Well, it's, it's no different that to, to your own personal development. Like that's the personal de development of Irata. That This is their level of understanding, their level of capability at the time. My, my level of understanding, level of capability at the time is this. And, and that's, that's where you're at. And, and even back to my equipment, the A21 safety factor, I'm, I'm still happy with it. But I've had education in the in the past six years, so my level of understanding and level of acceptance is changing. So, so hence hence a, a move, and I don't want to divert to this, but a move to a harder material. Yeah, more awareness, so, so, right? And and the small kick at the can for for Irata to to introduce um, a certified instructor ticket next. Well, who you know, because that level three is still or now, now he's a, a certified technician uh, as an instructor. 
Um, but now he's got to learn how to train. How, do, how does he deliver the course? How does he structure the course? Where does he start? Um, you know, does, you know, because as you'll, this could be a total side, side note for us, but you know, as you'll attest, but when it comes to equipment and, you know, geeking out on gear or opinions during a course, whether it's ARB or rope rescue or rope access, people can really get passionate about, about the way they like th to see things done or to do things themselves. So as soon as you start delivering, um, a course to a technician that has been at this for 20 years non-certified but now he's coming in he's just oh, oh, i can't oh, right so so you meet that kind of opposition how, how does it how, an instructor hasn't been trained to figure that out yeah right? so that's where train the trainer you you now know how to manage that kind of an ind individual right yeah for sure so mm -hmm. just to be clear uh level three is level three specifically this certification that allows you to instruct is that what that is no, no. So, so level, I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> I'm yeah. I'll, I'll start, I'll start from the very beginning for, okay, for the levels of, irat, of IRATA. Um, sure. In IRATA, there's a level one, 12 months, a uh, thousand hours, level two, 12 months, thousand hours, level three, 12 months, thousand hours. After that, if you have interest, you could go get your instructor. Okay. And gotcha. then there's an assessor, but each of these things have certain time served requirements in, okay. in them. Right. Um, and, and then after that, you can become an auditor, as in the errata system, to to audit uh, members. So so their 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 safety paperwork, Companies. their management system. So so the procedures. Um, over in Sprat, level one, fi uh, five hundred hours, uh, six months. Level two, five hundred hours, six months. Level three, five hundred hours, six months. And again, correct me, please, if I'm I'm not raw, up to date on that. Um, uh, I do not believe they have an instructor uh, cert. Um, th they may be working on it. I'm not sure. Uh, and then evaluator, again, requirements to become an or a uh, an evaluator. Okay. What about pay mm -hmm. for each of those levels? Is it standardized pay at each? No. No, not like um, apprenticeships and that kind of thing. I w when when I do product projects, uh, as I said earlier, through Access Anywhere, I I typically pay pay whatever level they are. I'm, I'm hiring an individual with a skill. Um, I, 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 I run so few jobs a year. I people, I pay people whatever that level they are for what they worth. That that's, that's what I do. Um, but in industry, typically, you know, when window washers, city work seems to, and, and I'm a little bit out of touch with this, uh, to, for up to date, but I kind of, kind of know what's happening, but w windows 20, 25, it sounds like sometimes a couple bucks more. For level okay. one, yeah. Uh, in industry, maybe maybe a few bucks more, thirty, thirty-five. I don't want to get a, anybody's hopes up. That's a pretty good up. jump, thirty, it, thirty-five. It's, it's it's not horrible. Um, it's it's not horrible at all. I mean, for I've I've got one lifelong friend actually. Uh, the, he man, it was. He's an old Lake Louise friend, and it was like. Two thousand nine or ten. Uh, and he realized what I was doing. He's like, "What's that? What's what is that work that you're doing?" And I'm like, "Oh, you take a course." You, uh, and and for for him, he's a very smart guy. Uh, typically, he's done sign things, uh, different labor jobs, and you know, just jobs for fun, yep. and fought, a bit of a ski bum. And and he he came in. I think he entered at like twenty five dollars an hour as level one at the time. And you couldn't. I don't know if he still can. Maybe he can these days. But at the time, you couldn't take a four day course, fifth day a set, so a five day week. And walk out on a Monday and make twenty five bucks an hour. Yeah, for the amount of time put into training mm -hmm. and yeah. cost essentially to get a half decent job mm -hmm. is pretty attractive. Yeah, and it's kind of cool and fun, right? Yeah. Because I also I think about that too. Like uh, when I got mm -hmm. out of the fire department, I had to retrain and you know find a new career and that sort of thing. And WCB is trying to put me through all this vocational stuff and research these careers and balance out whether it's worth it to put me through school and the amount of earnings I'd get and everything that I was interested in that would take, you know, at least two years in school to get yeah. a diploma would, would earn you like, yeah, like 20, 25 bucks an hour type jobs. And they're like, no, no, you can't do that. They yeah. want you to go and do something where you work away or it's high risk. And which is kind of why I got into a board culture and started my business as a, as a weird ho hole here. But, um, I looked at jobs that were like high risk. You had to be physically fit. Um, and they could be uncomfortable like being outside or doing whatever 
mm-hmm. then with all of those factors in place, you can generally earn more money for the amount of time you have to put into work. Yeah, and, and it's kind of like world. access. Hundred percent. It's a new world too, isn't it, Kurt? I mean, like you know, along your your journey, you know, you you've you went through that specifically in that in that in that way you know educational facility it's just it's just a new world man we're we're earning potential the way we earn money is just done differently these days you know we're we're making things we're we're putting ourselves out there as individuals you know we're not going for a four-year diploma to take on debt and hope to get a job it's just it's just different now yeah i don't put all my weight of thought that that's like the the stream you have to take anymore i feel like we are brainwashed as children that that's what you had to do you had to go through but, but all even, school even like, you had to go to even like i was saying though like that was our understanding as a social structure yeah at the time that's what yeah. we thought was important so now we're like stand by well it's the information the, age yeah we the connectivity out there now it's like you can do a you know a quote master class for anything out mm-hmm. there that's like a you know crazy niche of yours that you're really interested in Mm-hmm. and learn online from someone for way cheaper, yeah. get it done really quickly, and you can learn from like the best in the world. It's not like your local instructor from your community that's teaching you. You could have mm-hmm. somebody across the world teaching you that's like an absolute master in whatever it is, and yeah. get rid of all the fluff and the crap. And mm-hmm. sure, you don't have maybe some broad credential behind your name, you know, but that may not be necessary to find success in what you're doing, or you can get and, multiple and, certifications. And that's a- that's a bit of a catch 22, isn't it? Because back to, um, cause I agree with you and, and, but you have to choose how you apply that because sometimes that breadth of experience or that background, just similar to what we were saying about a 21 year old level three without life experience. Some have it, some don't mm-hmm. you, you in, in a four year certification, there's a reason why it was set up that way, uh, for a four year degree. You, you're, you're meant to get a breadth of experience. I, I actually, I, I went, out of college, I went to school for hotel restaurant management. It, it got me out west. I ended up working at Moraine Lake Lodge as a, as a, in 1994, spring of 94, as, as a co-op program. Um, but the one thing that was repetitious in what people were saying is including our instructor. It's just like, just go work at a restaurant. You'll get more education at that restaurant than you ever will here. Um, so to get that depth of knowledge and you know to to make your own mistakes um it, it's it's almost better to just go and do it yourself but um so fast tracking you know it, it's a catch-22 it, it's sometimes a lot of value in it um for certain certifications but but you also got to be careful on you know how much how much exposure even myself now that you know with rope's edge crossing over to arb and and rope rescue i mean strengths, limitations, standards. I mean, I under, certification, I understand these things, but my breadth of understanding in ARB, I mean, I get it. I could go climb a tree and, and even run a job and be pretty safe. But the way that you manage things and treat, you know, look, I, you know, I, I don't get it. And, and same with rope rescue. Like there's ins and outs yeah. and, and experience that you do not get without field application. Right, um, yeah, some nuances there. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely hard to teach everything to someone, mm-hmm. especially an actionable job where you're physically doing things with your hands, like in a classroom setting. You can only get so much theory before you have to get out there and start doing it. But yeah. I guess that's why they have hours on the job and mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So, as best you can, can you? Because we've talked about Irata and Spratt, and that's confusing, confusing for a lot of people. You're an Irata guy, but mm-hmm. like, is there any? benefit for you know a total green guy or an arborist that wants to kind of get into this and add this to their arsenal of uh, skills and things that they can do yeah how do you choose one over the other is there any you have to you have to decide on what you're doing with it um if you want skills and knowledge only do do either just do do the course and and absorb it and then you can come back and and do the tree work and with some more skills um and 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 again, with the, the time served and, and, and exposure to rope access methods, um, you're going to bring some of that to your tree work and go, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna put in a sling and a, and a foot loop here and just climb there, kind of like a climbing. Um, so you're gonna be able to apply them. Um, 
but you to answer your question it's more about deciding what you want to do with it uh, oil and gas typically is the irata system uh, that, that's where it's a global recognized uh, trade association for the oil and gas sector um, and most of the time uh, if not all of the time i think there's one or two uh, that that are not but um, are still in oil and gas but in different countries um, most of the time oil and gas uh, facilities ask for an irata cert if you're doing rope access okay yeah um, if you're doing windows or tower or uh, you know so many other um, non-industrial applications with rope access yeah sprats sprats sufficient but again it's it's just different because like i said earlier you know with the nuances and difference differences in in between uh you know the certification process between each system at each level they're, they're just different now so you're gonna learn um as a sprat level two i think it is when you learn this one uh as a level one you do the pickoff uh but as a level two in the rope rescue portion of the training you learn how to pass knots during a lower and a haul i think it's i think it's Maybe it's just one way, um, but we don't do that in Irata, so it's just different. So, so yeah. they're just they're just really different. If you're not going to oil and gas and you're just there for education, you want to get some rope knowledge, rope time, time on rope, get a certification, uh, doing windows uh, or to accent your rope rescue career uh, or fire departments, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. More might be sprat. good for yeah, more sprats. So mm -hmm. that might be good for more arborists because I'm just thinking through the eyes of some arborists mm -hmm. that might be listening. Um, unless they're thinking of transitioning completely out of this career to something new, then they could look at both with open eyes and consider going to oil industry. But I'm assuming that if you want to get into that, make good money, be consistent, mm -hmm. you're probably going to be working away. Am I right? Like working a week or two on potentially coming back, that sort of thing. It's not yeah. going to be a day here and there. No. Well, it could be. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, sometimes my, I think my biggest one away, I went to uh, the East coast of Canada. I drove out for this one's three month uh, project where I stayed away. I drove oh, out geez. for this thing on Cape Breton Island. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Good dudes. Good job. Good weather. It was summertime. It was great. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's a day. Okay. So, um, but mm -hmm. if they are looking to supplement, say a tree business where they're contract climbing arborist, mm -hmm. Um, or they have a sort of a part-time thing going on. They want to do a little bit of everything. You think Sprat might be more attractive yeah. to do it, that? It, it, so could, they could, it could be. My, my advice to anyone, like, so, so there's one thing that I didn't mention yet between the systems. Uh, the way IRATA works is if you're a train, a certified IRATA technician, you can work for a certified IRATA company. Okay, right. a member company. If you're a certified Sprat technician, you cannot work for IRATA companies. Okay. So weird, hey? However, the opposite is not true for Sprat. Sprat accept IRATA certified technicians, typically. The way I understand Sprat it, will again. accept IRATAs? Correct, the way I understand it. So, um, yeah, basically, okay. that, that's, that's the short story. Okay. Um, so you yeah. have a little bit more options if you are Sprat because you could it, work for... Oh, wait. If you are IRATA. IRATA, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's yeah. get that straight. So if mm -hmm. you're IRATA, you can work for an IRATA company, but you can likely work for a Sprat company as well. That's right, yeah. So okay, if you want that's... kind of the catch-all certification for rope access, it's IRATA. If you want it, but if you have a specific direction that will not typically change or you won't be going to oil and gas, um, okay. Sprat's What does Sprat and IRATA stand for? Ooh, good question. I actually challenge them. Um, it seems so silly. Um, but I challenge uh, the technicians on assessment day. <laughs> I feel like I'm assessing for that, you for for that one. So, so IRATA is the Industrial Rope Access Trade Association, uh, the Industrial Rope Access Trade Association, and SPRAT, um, unless they've changed it, uh, is the Society for Professional Rope Access Technicians. Okay. Yeah. Where do they originate from? Like, are they're both international? Is that correct? Um, like, uh, why so is short, two short answer: Yes. Like I just understand Pardon? why there's two streams that are very similar. Well, well, the, and, and this is this is just the beginning. This is just North America, uh, and and the two probably highest, rec uh, most recognized uh, rope access certifications. There are others. Uh, there's there's the soft system in uh, Norway. Is it Norway? Uh, could be. Shout out to Norway. You know, Scandinavia. From, yep. Yeah. Oh, kid. No way. Family heritage. Crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's uh, the Iran's. Uh, there, there's one in New Zealand. Uh, there's the uh, 
uh, the Australian one as well, but I believe that one's kind of switched over and been absorbed by or merged or something like that with, with Sprat completely. I, uh, Richard Delaney might be able to answer that question um, on the specifics. Um, but th th this is just this is just the beginning. This is only you know two of them. Uh, Irad is the most recognized and probably the most certified technicians globally and operational but but you know sprats kind of next in line it, and and it, it's a bit of a race it's a bit of a competition but but again they they just have different applications one's not better than the other how do you want to use it what's your goal where are you going to work what are you looking to gain what do you want to learn yeah is there a good amount of information on like their websites where you can kind of get a feel for the type mm -hmm. of work what they're doing i'm, I'm assuming there is for each one yeah yeah or, yeah, yeah. We were, I was going to ask you this at the end, but while we're talking mm -hmm. about it now, is there any good resources that people can go to after this uh, mm -hmm. to look at? Maybe like a YouTube channel, like someone who's talking through and discussing the differences. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know if you go on that anymore and being an assessor and so high level, you're probably not nerding out about rope access. No, I absolutely but, nerd out. I mean, even with the I nerd out about it, you know, even though I'm a little out of touch with Sprout a little bit, but, you know, I'm just not involved in the process on, on the day-to-day -day like I am in Irata, but... Uh, two, two parts to that uh, question. Um, yes, there are the websites. So irata, I-R-A-T-A dot O-R-G. So irata dot org. Um, and, and you can just go through the drop down menus to, to look for the certification process, the membership process as well, if you're interested. Um, and then Sprat is uh, the same, S-P-R-A-T dot org. Um, and, and similar process, just go through the drop downs to, to look for certification process. Is there any good videos and stuff online as far as... Yeah, that uh, was my second part that uh, I trailed off and forgot about. Um, the, the Be careful. <laughs> be careful about that. I, I, you, as much as what we just talked about there, uh, the information age is... There's a wealth of knowledge out there, but there is also a wealth of misinformation. Oh, yeah. Arboriculture um, is good for that, too. But, you know, we're all going to be on there anyways. That's right. I know. So... I, I'm not going to advise it. There are a couple of them out there uh, for the for both organizations. Um, uh, you know, uh, they might even uh, have their own videos too for each organization. They, uh, yeah, I read it started to to produce videos. Um, so, so produce the web website for that. Um, Training member companies um, have started to do videos as well, um, but they, they can be confusing as well. But but also some of them are really really good. Like, they're, like they're, but it's a small kick at the can. They're 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 starting to produce the videos. Um, I think actually the one that I will mention is uh, the Rope Access channel okay. uh, on on YouTube and Insta, and I think he's on TikTok as well. Um, Guy's name is Alex. He's doing things out of uh, out of the Netherlands. He works for a company, uh, but he's also uh, like a few years now. Uh, he's got some really good do's and don'ts, how tos, methods, training techniques, and and a good message. Very non opinionated, right? Um, nice. Strong opinions don't have anywhere in the industry. Like it's it's we haven't even if we have done it this way all the time. There's a reason why we're changing because lessons learned tell us difference um different information um so so he's, he's good the rope access channel um that for, sounds for good videos. people mm -hmm. uh you know at least can go on there and just like see see the gear like what it what guys are wearing where they're working at different locations just to get yeah. a feel for the industry and then see if like if that's something they're interested in or not and what kind of commitments it takes yeah. Um, mm. Speaking of commitments, are there any other considerations, um, like physically or mentally, that you know something uh, sort of specialized that someone generally should have to go into this industry, or can just anyone pick it up? You think? Um, you know, you would think, and and sometimes that happens. I, I would say, when, when in the requirements for IRATA, uh, a head for heights is talked about explicitly so you gotta have a head for heights if you're not comfortable at heights you know what, what are you what are you doing right yeah um you know like aptitude and attitude you got to be able to uptake the information on a four-day course because most courses is just four days if you cannot absorb and then regurgitate um you know all of that information in four days maybe it's not for you um but but also assessments are 
are difficult because it's a test, right? You got some strains that are watching you. You're, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. Uh, so yeah. during an assessment, you know, my job as an assessor uh, in the errata system is to step back and let you have your day. And I talk about that. I'm like, hey, guys, we're all here. I understand the assessment day stress. And I actually bring in my own, you know, assessment day stress. And I indicate whether it's present or not uh, my own level of stress because I've got eight strangers that I've now got to talk to. Public speaking isn't for everybody. OK, so I've got my own stuff. You know, I know the system. I'm confident in my in my knowledge base. But I share that just to create a level of comfort in hopes to create a level of comfort anyway. So so I understand very clearly that they're already putting a level of uh, uh, pressure on themselves on, on, on test day. So uh, but what we compare that to uh, typically, I don't know if it's really that true. I don't know. I haven't really thought in about it in a while. But we often say uh, assessment day stress compares to rescue stress. How are you going to handle yourself under pressure? Yeah. Good what, point. what do you yeah, what are you actually going to, how are you going to respond um, when, you know, the his shit hits the fan? Yeah. You know, you're just going to have a, a tizzy and because you got a rope tangle and just freak out or you're going to handle yourself and, and get to work, right? It's it's a different thing. So There is a hikes. lot of mm -hmm. a lot of stress coming in from different angles with that. And I can relate too with the fire department. I remember like there was a lot of stress around testing. But mm -hmm. I would probably say it wasn't as much stress as actually going to calls and dealing with those emergencies. Mm -hmm. And then compound that with being new and working mm -hmm. with a team and everyone observing you and judging yeah. you and seeing if you're there, if you're going to make it, if you're going to fit in, if you're making mistakes, like that kind of thing. Like, So you're being watched at the same time as someone having an emergency and people in bystanders in the background freaking out and they're stressed out. It's like you got to mm -hmm. be able to deal with all that. You got to do it. doing things safely. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the aptitude and the errata system anyway. And, I, and that's one of the reasons why I really, when you ask, Kurt, man, I, I like this kind of a conversation. When you ask, I'm like, yes, because this guy likes to talk about those nuances of the human condition, right? Because that, those are the variables, whether, you know, jam. it's... It's it's important, and I think it's a major part of uh, of what we we haven't, uh, but are beginning to approach in in the in the day to day conversation of going to work in these extreme environments, right? Um, you know the, the variables, and and I, I really want to have a podcast or a discussion um, about variables um, because all those things are coming into play. So. Uh, and, and it's a major part of it. So I uh, head for heights, assess, you know, how do you handle pressure, uh, physical fitness, of course, you know, the physical aspect of this thing, it's important. And if, if you can't do a series of pull-ups all day and yeah. not pull a muscle, um, maybe it's not for you. Um, it probably goes it, hand in hand for people. I mean, you would almost necessarily need to be fit to not only just perform the job in those different mm -hmm. scenarios, but um, like, again, getting back to the stress and different things like physical fitness offsets those stress. So likely the person that's going to be good at rope access or attracted to it already mm -hmm. has some sort of regime built into their life yeah. where they're dealing with emotional stressors or physical stressors by exercising and doing all these things in place. That's so. right. And, and that is, and, and I'll throw this in there not right now because we've, and we visited it a while ago, but I got into rope access because I was climbing and mountain mm -hmm. biking and doing outdoor things in the UK when I was living there. And I still do. It's a major part of my life. So it's a means to an end. I enjoy uh, the extreme sports for a lack of a better term. Um, yeah. Or, But now the problem, the real issue that we have, whether it's Arbor or um, well, maybe, maybe not Arbor because you, don't, you guys don't bring in trades to, I don't know, you run electrical wire in trees? Probably not. Um, uh, I take I cut Christmas lights out of trees when people leave them in. <laughs> do, do you guys bring in electricians for uh, that application? Probably not. No, no. So, so, but what I'm what I want to make the point of is marrying the trade with the rope access certification. Um, I'll try and do a Coles notes um, bit of detail on this story, um, but that all that doesn't always work out for people that got the union call out ticket to, they don't even know what they're showing up for. Um, right. So now they think it's a glorified fall arrest course. Um, you know, so, so they need to the tradesman that's going in to get their certification. Yeah. Rope access. Okay. That's right. So, so that tradesman got 
a union call out ticket at the at the at the hall hasn't had a proper and this the union side of things I am completely separated from so I do not know how they what the ins and outs are maybe it's more robust more involved more um, more of a process than I understand it but my experience is I've as a trainer is I've had several union called out individuals for a level one certification and they, they don't even know why they're, why they're there they think they just need this workout hike course. Maybe it's fall rest. They don't even know. And you know, they're 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 just large individuals and not physically fit. Um, they don't know. They don't know why they're there. They've done no preliminary study. Um, you know what I'm getting at? So yeah, you you got to be physically fit. They don't fit um, that mold, or they're, and they're not coming at it with that mindset of that they're wanting to really be there in the first place. Yeah, which we deal mm -hmm. with in. Arboriculture Canada, some open enrollment courses sometimes. Because, right. I mean, not to necessarily to that degree, but there is a lot of people that are kind of sitting there and, they, you know, they got that body language, like they have to be there. You know, they'd probably rather be out doing something else. And not paying then, it for them from, yeah, on their, their own. Yeah, mm -hmm. their boss sent them and paid for it mm -hmm. and they have to go through this course. And, yeah. you know, they're often like an older dude that's been doing it for 20 years and they have to come back and repeat this course. And, yeah. You know, and you and gotta, then, so now we're back to that, you know, like those eight personalities. Now that guy's doing those things. That individual is acting this way. So you got to yeah. figure that out. You got to figure out because now you've got the other seven people that are interested. Yeah. And now you got to manage that person and, and, yeah. and deal with, all right, well, how much work am I going to give him? You're so like my, my, one of the things in the, in the, uh, I write a log book as an instructor, you, uh, your, you log your pass rate. Um, this is an opinion, and I, I've already said that we typically keep opinions out of it. But I personally, as as a instructor, doing the thirty to forty courses a year for the time that I did, and then you know two, three, or five a year after that, um, I don't feel that the pass rate has anything to do with the instructor's efforts. It shouldn't anyway, because the instructor is going to deliver a course equally to uh, the students and put the most effort in. And that person that you were just talking about, if he's not interested, there's only, I can't, I can't help him. Yeah. Right. I, I can't do anything for him. Yeah, for sure. hundred mm -hmm. percent. I mean, that's, yeah. that comes down to uh, knowing how to be a good instructor and assessor and all that kind of stuff too. And you know, like you said, to try and get through to those people and having those chats right away when they show up of like, here's how it kind of is. Mm -hmm. I need you to be engaged. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. You know, mm -hmm. so they have this expert. They know what the expectations are before they get going. A lot of yeah. the times, these people, once you connect with them, especially if you connect with them one on one, outside mm -hmm. of the group, if you need to, if it's that bad, then you can get some sort of understanding there, and they might be able to reengage. But not everyone. But that's fine because that's what that's what the whole point of the process is: is to weed those people out. Like you don't want to just be passing everyone mm -hmm. that goes through it just for the sake of the fact that they paid to sign up and come to the course. Yeah. Right. Because you can have unsafe work practices and people not engaged like that's well that's right it's, it's, a that it's a pass fail whether it's sprat or errata or arb can it you know it's a pass fail you can either do the stuff or you can't if you can't that's okay yeah come back do some more training try and assess again right and and typically if, if we see people having an unsuccessful day on assessment day um they come back two three four weeks later uh with they go away they let it settle and simmer figure out you know a small kick it can right so they they different pers perspective more understanding because of heads they come back and they get into excellent that's what i see yeah I, you know most people that brain fart it's it's come back and get a, a full pass excellent so so we were probably the opposite i mean as far as being gung-ho wanting to get into it and like let's go right now i can't wait till my course gets here um, is there anything someone new that's eager can do? Maybe they're worried about like the fact that it's going to be a lot of information in four days. Mm -hmm. um, can they do anything as far as experience or preparation? Is there any pre-reading or mentorship yeah. they can get started with before mm -hmm. the before the course, or to like assist them along with this path? Yeah, one hundred percent. I would say read up on the certification requirements uh, for both SPRAT or IRATA. So, so IRATA have tax, the training assessment certification scheme. That's a document available under publications on the website. Uh, and then SPRAT have, I think it's still called the certification requirements. Uh, and in those documents gives you exactly what's required of you as a level one and only read that. Don't, don't, don't go on to the rescue level two stuff and level three stuff. Just read what level you are going through 
uh, going to challenge as a candidate and um, and understand that as some pre reading that isn't YouTube random. Um, that's about as because because if, if you know what's required of you from those documents, you know this process. You know the certification that you're going for, and you've Can done you your due diligence. Around? Sorry. Can you hang mm -hmm. around or job shadow um, rope access people? Like if you want to go for the day to kind of get a feel for it, are you allowed to do that? Uh, like safety wise? Yeah, that's up to the company owner and the supervisor. Okay. If yeah. everybody's okay with it, it shouldn't be a problem. But you know, you got to create that relationship and yeah. And can you, can you go out and recreationally do it? Like I know with Arborists, like it's people want to be a climber. We'd say like, you can literally go out and recreational climb trees and get used to it and get used to the feel yeah. and do all this and that like build up some strength the, whatever the, you want to do that's that's the thing about the certification process or you know working for member companies or non-member companies you can do what you want i mean you can get onto amazon right now and buy some certified or non-certified so be careful uh equipment at random spend your five or seven hundred bucks two thousand bucks on some gear and go do stuff um nothing's gonna stop you um i would never advise uh, that, uh, you know, working at height is obviously a thing. It's a problem. Gravity, it's, it's not the fall that kills you. It's a sudden, sudden stop, right? Um, at the end. <laughs> so, you know, you, you want to be safe and you want to be doing it right. And you want to be sure that you're doing it right. I, I would by all means say, go and get certified. If this is something that you, you're interested in, get certified. It's, it's, it's fun. It's a great week. Um, it's, it's not rah, rah, and we're rooting for you. It's let's get certified and be safe. Um, it's, it's not an honorary pass, but, um, but you know, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing stopping you go get certified and then buy some gear, uh, do your investigation, uh, play with the gear, get your hands on it, get passionate yeah. if you're keen, right? How do you find work once you've gotten your level one? I mean, it's you... not like an apprenticeship where you're already signed up with a company, right? Mm -hmm. like, do you have to go and then find a job and say, I got my certified, my level one now. Yeah, um, and I was thinking about this one actually this morning um, because what I used to say is, uh, you know, it takes you know two three months uh, to get your first job, and that's typically what it used to take. Um, but you got to be on the ops managers, the hiring managers, the HR, whoever your contact you mean just is in the hunting, company. Like just getting out there and just putting getting out, resume. out there. Okay. Yeah, typically I would say you know f friends or or. Um, like back in the day, right? It was it was about three months before you were really working and on board with a company. Um, nowadays, you're working right away. It's it's oh, there's a lot of need for it. Oh, there's a massive demand, uh, from really? my understanding. Yeah, a lot of people in the rope access industry they've they've said over the years that oh, a lot, too many level threes or oh, there's too many level twos. The market's saturated. Too many, too many, too many. But I'll um, I'll say this. Um, in my career, I'm, I'm currently working with a company um, that's multinational. Uh, I am an employee, and they did a feasibility study two year, uh, five years ago, uh, looking at bothering even becoming an IRATA member, and the reason why they didn't, manpower. Hmm. They, they were like, might not be enough manpower. So, but now they're wow. in the game. Now they're into it. Um, yeah. because they see the value in it. And this is where, you know, the, the trajectory of rope access being used as a method of access. A lot of these conglomerate companies uh, in the construction, commercial and industrial, obviously where it's been a long time, they're getting up to speed in and seeing the value in times and safety. Safety stats are increased. Time savings is, uh, what would that be? Decreased, um, increased. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously, you know, it, it just costs less uh, for rope access as uh, as a method. Uh, so, so there's all sorts of change. Uh, I forgot how I got onto that one, but well, yeah. we we're just talking about finding work, and I'd say if I could offer any advice for people just, you know, being a business owner looking in, or from my own experiences when I was younger mm -hmm. trying to find work. I think my dad had always kind of pushed me into this, but mm -hmm. instead of being that person who just responds to like a job ad, you know, mm -hmm. like some company that puts it out on Indeed and everyone's just applying, like go out there and research the companies in your area yeah. like where you want to work what part of the industry you want to do and go work there like they may not have a job posting chances are if they're a good company and people want to work there they treat their employees well they don't have a lot of turnover they probably don't even have to put out job postings because the right people come to them so take that initiative reach out to them find mm -hmm. out who the right people are that you need to meet go shake their hand in person give them a resume in person mm -hmm. follow up with an email follow up with all this kind of stuff like 
if you're a squeaky wheel and you show genuine interest, because that's what yeah. that's what's really needed in employees anywhere, in my opinion. It's mm-hmm. not just the qualification. Like you want the person that has the right mindset that wants to be there and that wants to get yeah. better. And it's like, yeah, this is the right guy. So that's how I would go about trying to find a job. And I bet you yeah. would take too and long. In those, it, historically, in those three months, that, that would have been the second part of my spiel to them. It was take time, but just be the squeaky wheel. Keep, keep on the ropes at the, the rope access manager that would be yeah. hiring you. Because if, you're, if your resume is on their desk, when they have to man up by 20 over here, by three over here, and by four over here, and by you know 40 man job over here, your resume is right there. They're calling you, right? Yeah. Ve- if, if they don't see you in front of their face, they're not going to call you. And a job e- like even this if they where, need you. Exactly. And then basically their requirements to hire someone is like they need a human with this certification. Yeah. So it's like what makes you different than everyone else? Because yeah. everyone that's applied has that certification. So what are the extras that you're going to bring? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's that is another part of it, uh, Kurt. You know, like get get, get extra certifications. Take it upon yourself to uh, get the fall arrest cert if you work in the east coast of Canada. You know, you have to have that even to do rope access. Uh, you know, get the accompanying. Um, you know, your drug and alcohol. Just go get it done. Uh, get your first aid as a level three is a requirement for for errata. Um, might be for Sprat now these days. I'm not sure. Um, pro- probably is actually. Um, you know, get get your first aid. Get get these accent certifications in place so that you you just go to work Mm -hmm. yeah that's a great idea to get some of those extras i mean at first it shows initiative plus Mm -hmm. it could be valuable to them so like if you're on a volunteer fire department or yeah maybe you were in a board culture and you've already done some climbing it's like i'd probably look at an arborist that's already got some experience climbing and doing that Mm -hmm. that wants to dabble in uh, rope access over someone who hasn't yeah you know what i mean yeah there's a difference between reality and like when you when you're when you're a motivated technician, you know, you want to buy your own equipment and all these different things, you know, geek out and stuff, but you know, be, be patient, you know, wait, wait to be supplied with your rope access equipment. Typically that's how it works anyway. Um, you know, window cleaning, maybe they'll accept you with your own kit, but you know, that's an inspection process should be anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not about the biggest, um, uh, you know, loudest individual that, tells you that they're good at rope rescue or tells you they've got 10,000 hours on rope. Yeah. You know, you, you, you know, you, you don't want all the latest gear. It's not about being shiny and stuff. It's, it's about, like you were saying, you know, competent, you got to have the cert, you got to be mindful of what you're doing, what's your direction, do your research on, on, on the company and, uh, and just know your stuff. Don't, don't fluff it up. You can't, you can't fluff up your resume anymore because, you know, proof's in the pudding when you're climbing, man, it's, you can, you can see it. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, So we talked a little bit about trajectories and advancement opportunities. We actually never talked about level three, but how much do you think a level three person would would earn generally? 45 to 55, maybe. Oh, sick. That's pretty Mm -hmm. good. 40 to 55. So we're looking about a three-year investment to get Mm -hmm. to level three, would you say, with... uh, uh, two, four, six, maybe six to eight thousand dollars in training costs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but you're mm-hmm. you're working while you're doing that too, so you're yeah. earning some money. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, it. Hopefully, fair? Anyway. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. I think that's that's attractive. Is there a need? Like, is there a lot of jobs for a level three out there, or is it like does it become more difficult to to actually get paid at those levels? Because no, that's a good question. So uh, there's always a need for all, all of them. I, I, I think I, I don't think the matri- the, in, uh, the, 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 the industry will be saturated anytime soon myself, but there's always a need of level threes. Um, I, I used to say, um, if you're, if you're a, a trade certified or a trade um, certified, like if you got your red seal for something, uh, level two, that's the best position to be. Um, for always being able to go to work. Um, primarily because as soon as you become a level three, typically there's more level threes these days. So this happens a little bit less nowadays, but not, and again, I'm kind of out of touch with real field technicians, like a lot of them, right? Um, but the, uh, tip typically uh, they put you, at, you become a level three and, you, and you're working as a level three. So you're supervising a little bit more nowadays 
there's more level threes around, they'll build a team of level threes because that's where you've got the real, like, man, you build it, like, because sometimes when you get a level one on a, on a job, they cannot, they are not efficient on rope yet. They just finished a course or they've right. got 60 or 80 or even 600 hours and they are still not moving very well. Right. They're certified, they're capable. There's a big difference from a new level one certified and someone who's about to go to do level two, for example. Very, very different, very different, very different. Um, and so, so building a job of level threes for, you know, say, a, 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 you know, there's six level threes on a job you got a fast moving efficient project the way a rope access should work because everybody knows their job even if they haven't been assigned specifically if you got three workers over here and you know two supervisors over here but they're all level threes everybody gets it you know it needs done because yeah. this guy's also been the, the supervisor um so so yeah is that answer yeah for sure what do you think you alluded to this um different trades that combine well and dovetail nicely with rope access, what would you say the most attractive trade certifications or experience skills would be for someone who wants to, you know, they love rope, they want to get into rope access, but they know inevitably they're going to be getting, doing other things like, mm -hmm. are you uh, construction or welding or electrician? Like what's most attractive you think from your point of view? Um, from my point of view, might be different to what I've seen. What I've seen is the inspection ticket. So, so visual, uh, UT, you know, mag dial, all, all the inspection tickets. So the NDE, uh, we used to call it um, NDT, non-destructive testing, uh, okay. non-destructive evaluation. Uh, I don't know what it's, the E stands for. It's different now. Um, so non-destructive. Get, get your inspection tickets. That that'll get and get your IRATA ticket as a level one. You'll be you'll be working up north, liggety split. Um, that's what I've seen. So that's um, yeah, more oil and gas then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And also, you know, roller coasters, uh, you know, ski hills, um, right? So they need inspecting, uh, things like that. You can get lucky enough to go to ski hill jobs or whatever, uh, or do a roller coaster. Um, you know, coatings inspection, your nascent inspection ticket uh, for coatings, uh, applying, removing, and inspecting. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, that, that that's uh, not easy to get, but you know neither are the inspection tickets. Um, what welding on rope is 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 hard work, uh, but, but also a very high value trade uh, that that'll keep you busy. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, you mentioned a couple of fun things. Maybe you can just list off a bunch because I mm -hmm. just don't even know. Probably a lot of us don't even know. But like, you could work on roller coasters. You can wash windows. You can go work in the oil and gas industry. What, were, what are some other ones that are just kind of like yeah. cool and attractive that are out mm -hmm. there? Um, for me, I mean, I worked on all sorts of different things. Uh, when I when I uh, lived in the UK, I worked on uh, uh, football grounds. I did a lot of painting of, of stadiums, uh, lots, of, lots and lots and lots of aid climbing. I'd, I'd be doing pull-ups all day for days on end uh, or night shifts on end. Um, so a lot, a lot of painting and coatings of uh, football grounds over in the UK. Manchester Stadium was one of them uh, hmm. in the Man U, uh, Man United. Uh, that, that was a pretty flagship uh, project for me. It was awesome. It lasted cool. a long time. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty cool. Uh, pretty messy, but a uh, lot, lot of experience, a lot of, lot of uh, good crew again. Um, what other ones uh, in, the, in the UK? I also did a lot of um, uh, train uh, rail, like railway. That so in the UK, the trains, uh, you know, trains can't climb hills, right? So they got to yeah. go through tunnels to keep level. And in the UK, they just made tunnels over the the mountains. So so a lot of tunnel inspection, but the the air shaft. Oh yeah. Uh, would need inspecting. So we did some of that. So it was a lot of remote hiking stuff. Uh, so to inspect. Uh, you know, so just bas space. basically sounding inspections on on the brickwork on these on these air shafts to the to the tunnels, uh, bridge some bridge inspection, uh, confined space is another big one, but that that kind of crosses over pretty heavily into the confined space rescue world. Okay. Um, so, sometimes our RATA member companies get hired out as a as a standby rescue uh, team, and that can happen. Um, it's not a direct. Um, uh, thing, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it, it can happen, but rope rescue companies are more rope rescue confined space, educated co and certified companies are, are better 
suited. Um, what else? I don't know. Uh, a climbing in uh, in in Tesco stores. I did a lot of this in the UK um, in the earlier days. A lot of aid climbing from uh, girder to girder in uh, inspecting. In, in in 2000, the L regulations came into the UK, where you, it was all about uh, you know saving the planet at the time, and it still is. It should be, uh, but but air pressure in buildings um, was we were losing energy through the cracks in in the where the services penetrated the buildings. So we had to seal holes hmm. above above the drop ceiling in Safeway and Tesco stores hmm. all over all over the UK. So they just um, like take you aside when you show up and they're like, "Hey guys, here's the stuff, and here's how you seal a crack." And they should show you, and then they're that's, like, "Well, it, it was, off you it go." It was mas mastic, like mastic, 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 or 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 uh, expansion foam. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of that kind of stuff, and 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 boards. But you know, by the end of it, you know, we we would have um, you know sealed a, a, a theoretical you know two meter hole you know, collectively of all the tiny holes, it equaled yeah. this kind of air escape in the building. So we would aid climb and, and fill these holes, um, which is a lot of fun. So, so typically though, you know, that, that was, that was a lot of my UK experience, uh, amongst many, many others, but you know, windows are good. Uh, atriums are good. I actually had a project, um, under my company, uh, labor supply anyway, uh, in, in Manitoba last year, last summer, where I, I had a few people, including myself, uh, hel helping a roofing company, a large uh, um, um, fabric roofing company, uh, put on the final touches uh, to. I'm going to forget the name of the building now. Um, anyway, in in uh, in in Manitoba. No worries. Uh, Win Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. Brain fart right now, but uh, that one was awesome. It was um, above a big green space so it was an it was a large atrium all all uh, glass uh, roof and just aid climbing as well and just just doing fitted tightening bolts uh, uh painting uh, finishing touches and stuff like that nice okay one yeah. more thing i just thought of here um mm -hmm. as far as consistency for work uh, it sounds like you can go up north and you can do maybe some long-term mm -hmm. contracts and work more consistently like i don't know if we're talking monday to friday or what but is there, and then some of these other contracts that you've done where it's like you go and you go for a few months at a time, but can people expect, you know, time off, even if they work for a different, like, does that company have to continually employ you full time or are you taking time off in between these contracts? Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, that, that's, that's the deal between you and the company really. And, and what kind of company it is and what, what, kind, what their needs are. Uh, tip, typically, um, for what I see in the city anyway, uh, in Calgary, uh, yeah. I'm in Cochrane, um, uh, but what I see for the rope access uh, window window cleaning companies in the city, the guys uh, that keep busy are pretty committed, and they, and they commit to each other, and they've got some really good crews that, that they can you know each rely on each other. Uh, if you want to be a contract uh, rope access technician, yeah, go and get the experience with a different company. Just keep good relationships. If you're if you're a little bit flippant about you know bailing on somebody, they're not going to use you again, right? Yeah. Um, so, so you know, same as anything. That's just character and morals. Um, but one thing that I always say, you know, in the in the time that rope act that that I've been involved with rope access and and I care about it, like a lot of these things what, that that I am doing with Rope's Edge um, and you know even this podcast, I I I I, well, I do want to give back. I'm pass. I care about it, right? Um, so it's given me a lot. Um, in many, many different ways over the years. Um, so it's kept me busy, you know, financially and, and just, just everything. It's, it's, it's been very good to me as an industry. Uh, so I got no complaints. So I would say, yeah, you're going to be busy if you want to, but you can, you can build that how you want, whether it's an industrial company or the commercial window companies. Um, you can kind of, you know, do you choose. think there's an opportunity for arborists to do this in the off season? Like it depends on where you're from, but a lot of us, hmm. Are more seasonal, so you know, come yeah. December what's, what's your maybe. I'll, well, for, for me, it's like I slow down in probably November, December, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit here and there. But you know, I could probably crunch it all into November, be done from December all the way until, uh, you know, March, maybe even start up in April if I wanted to kind of move jobs around. So, so then let me ask you this: So you're working in trees uh, mostly through the spring, fall, and summer. Yeah. Uh, why, why do you have a spring, fall, summer focus? 
on a, on a season? What what's what happens in the for winter, trees? Right? Yeah. Well, nobody calls when it's cold and snowy. <laughs> So you just run so, 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 so typically, do it's you want to be on? Couldn't do tree work. Do you want to I mean, be on rope in minus forty? No, I was thinking more indoor work though. But as yeah, a rope, if you're, if you're mostly lucky. outdoor. Well, and and that's why I kind of you know answer your question with a question in a way because just 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 to have that realization. Yeah, you you could actually absolutely supplement uh, our work uh, with rope access. It does take place through the winter, um, typically a lot less. I would say the commercial sector of rope access windows. Uh, have a similar season to yours. So you might not be on rope in a mm -hmm, building, mm -hmm. on a building doing windows, but industry, you know, things that, you know, pipes are blowing up and there's ice castles uh, or insulation needs dealing with in oil and gas uh, through the winter. So, so yes, you could keep busy that way. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we should wrap things up, but I heard you're uh, starting a podcast of your own. You got a fancy, <laughs> you got a fancy mic there. So, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about that? Making up as I go, man. Uh, no different uh, than anything I've done along my life. It's I appreciate the question. Um, it's uh, it's been a pipe dream for a long time. Uh, you know the same as me. Um, it's uh, difficult to put yourself out there, put your face on on the screen. Uh, so I've I've been apprehensive, even though I have purchased and you know planned and all these things. Um, but I've got a few invites out there now, a few people on the schedule, which is exciting, and they've agreed to it, and then, you know, with specific topics. So yeah, it's it's coming. Has it got a name yet? Um, so you know, yeah, that's what kind that's of flow, happening. What it doesn't have a name yet? You said no, not, yet? not officially. No. Okay, well, that's always fun coming up with a name and logo mm -hmm. and stuff. What uh, what themes do you kind of want to tackle? I mean, obviously rope access, but any kind of nuances to rope access, or are you just going to go all over the place, or? Well, I'll try and I'll try and keep it focused. And if it's if it's if it's really all over the place, you want to keep it focused. Focus. But I, I want to talk about the industry. I want to spread uh, awareness, uh, uh, increase safety, and increase efficiency for the climber. I want I want the guys to be educated, right? Because as an assessor, that that's my you know my my involvement with the rope access community these days is typically the assessor. All right. And it's very, the, the, the assessor experience interaction is, is really, unfortunately, very, very different to an instructor, which, which is where I really built my deep love uh, for the human interaction um, and also built my deep knowledge of the programs that I, that I understand now. Um, so it's, 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 it's a two part thing. So, so I'm, I'm, I, I show up as an assessor, you know, I, I assess you're, you're, you're there. Uh, it's, it's not a social thing. It's, it's very, it's a very different interaction. Um, but, the, but when, when I see technicians, uh, sometimes mo most times they're successful, sometimes they're unsuccessful, but overall I'm there as a third party individual. Um, so I can't, I can't talk about, uh, what's happening in the industry industry. You know, like I'm there third party. I'm not yeah. meant there. And, and that's in the code of ethics. And, and I stand by that very, very wholeheartedly. I don't talk about my equipment, obviously. I, I don't really have large, you know, conversations. So so I'm, I kind of feel like I miss out, even though I'm, I do the assessment. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm missing out on, uh, you know, the instructor side of things that that's where I really built my real passion for and love for the interaction of talking about gear and, and really developing knowledge and understanding uh, deeply. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a big part of the motivation. And another part obviously is, you know, to flog my gear, but it's, it's overall the, the motivation for, for my equipment is increased safety and efficiency. So, yeah. so, so, and, and, and over and over and over again, you see online and, and you'll see, this in your industry as well, I'm sure, uh, just these practices that people are posting, but you can't comment because it doesn't help anything, yeah. you, you know? So I just want, like, if, if they're online, I want to create a platform, video or audio, that educates, that really creates a deeper understanding. Yeah, it provides um, value and provides yeah. value and, and changes the minds of people uh, to 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 get it get interested get involved um, make better decisions um, you know one, one of the ideas for a podcast is uh, don't buy my gear <laughs> Be because I want to see you make better decisions and if you're on P of protect you've skipped out you know there's in, in the errata system there's identify remove avoid protect verify if you're on protect that's the last line of defense. 
So that's a yeah. topic that people need yeah. to understand. And I'm sure it's no different in ARB, but you know, you, you know, protect is you putting a barrier, barrier between the sharp thing and the rope. But did, did you remove a void first? Did you really rule that out as a safety precaution? Right. Because, or did you just accept the fact that the company handed you a bunch of rope pro and you're just going to lay that on and be done with it? Right. Without really thinking about it. So, so anyway, so, so I'll, I'll be, I'll be as, as organized as I can. And uh, yeah, I've got a few topics for some individuals that I've handed out and uh, requested. And, they, and they've said, yeah, I think that, you know, cause I know when I do have chats with industry people, uh, you know, assessors, instructors, company owners, I know where they're at and I know what they care about and I know what their motives are. So I, I've kind of targeted them that way. Um, uh, sim similar for you uh, and me here, I think. Yeah, I think when you get to that level, you kind of you want to give back and you see how you can kind of fit in there. I think podcasts are great, even though podcasts are not like a new thing anymore. That original surge, kind of like we were talking of some other podcasts in both of our industries have kind of fizzled out. Mm -hmm. So there's available space for it. And then both of us wanting to just connect with our community, not just because we have a product to sell or a mission to sell. Like for me, it's Atmos tree, but I mean, how am I going to mm -hmm. get in touch with people at Atmos tree? It's like, well, I need to get in touch with the community and ultimately giving back and planting trees is great. But at the end of the day, what I love the most is getting to know other arborists, other people in these industries and we love learning. So it's like the podcast ties all that together and it's like a voluntary platform where people can tune in and listen if they want mm -hmm. and they can tune out if they don't like it, mm -hmm. you know? So Yep. It's like free value. Here you go. Come on, check it out. Leave your opinion if you like, and it's a great way to uh, to hook up. And then ultimately, um, you may be able to get some more ideas or sell some of your product, you know, indirectly. And I can get more arborists aware of Atmos Tree that want to join on, and it's it's great. I just love it. Yeah, I, I fully agree. But and you're a parent too, right? Yeah. One of the things for me, you know, same for me, my little one's seven and a half years old. And when she kind of came into my world, it's it started this whole trajectory, this whole path of just being better. You know, like I'm like I said, I'm 51 now. How did that happen? She came <laughs> around when I was 44. I don't know. T tell me if you can relate to this. But all these things that we're talking about here, self-improvement, do a better thing, you know, cr provide value, actually improve the industry that you've been a part of for 20 plus years. Um, th that's just making the planet better, you know, and, instead yeah. of just, you know, taking you're, you're giving back and providing value and feeling and, and putting that example in front of your child. Um, and at an earlier age, um, you know, because I didn't have that, right? For so, sure. Each generation, know, I think it gets better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, just more technology, more awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've heard of like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where they talk about, you know, if people don't aren't familiar, but it's like the mm -hmm. bottom is like the mindset is like surviving. You know, like if you live in that mindset of like you literally are surviving for shelter and whatever, that's like the bottom. But like essentially, if you're living like, paycheck to paycheck that's another form of survival for people and they have to work super hard and they're just like maybe they have lots of kids and they're a single parent like all these different things but the point is that those things don't allow you to think outside of the box very often mm -hmm. so some people and through generational improvements may be more you know quote privileged to have those opportunities so we've taken the time through our first 40 years to learn these skills, do these things. And can you get to that point where it's like, okay, what can I do now? Like, what is my life purpose? What can I give back? And I used to think, ah, I don't have to do anything. Like I kind of made it, I can just chill, whatever. But mm -hmm. then I had this kind of insight one day and I was like, you know, when I think about that hierarchy of needs and all these, all the people in the world, like there's not a lot of people in the whole world that actually have that opportunity to be creative and push the limits and develop something new and give back mm -hmm. and teach and literally make a difference as cheesy as that sounds like think of tons of people I, I even even, here in Cochrane, like working so, full time day to day like they when are they going to do it right yeah it's, it's just survive 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 and, and and i don't even like i don't even like that um what do you call that Th throwing that caveat in there like of as cheesy as i don't care about cheesy anymore man it is just the truth it is awareness that we're missing and you know it's been all tough guy blah, blah, just muscle through survive 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 for so long it's the this is the information age this is this is how i define it anyway so so we look at, you know, it's, it's right there for us. Learn the thing. If, if you're failing at something, 
or if you're not successful at marketing something or if you're not successful at being a father, uh, get online and learn it. It's there for you. So, so, so it, it's, it's all of those, that information is right there for us to better improve, uh, you know, to be, you know, for me, it's, it's, uh, uh, kiddo first, uh, finance, finances and business second, and then, and then, and then me, all of these things get daily, uh, you know, the daily 1%, right. uh, self, self-improvement, be a better dad, be more patient, be more attention, uh, um, tuned in with attention to your child and all these things just to be a better person all around. So, so it, yeah. it really all just comes together because then, then totally. where do you end up? You're not just in that survival yeah. level of hierarchy. You, you move bumping up and eventually you, you make it to the tip of the triangle, which is yeah, what's think- on top. I think uh, a lot of us are very fortunate to be at the top of that triangle. And I think in turn with that comes, in my opinion, some responsibility, Mm -hmm. you know, on those days where I find it a bit hard to do some of this stuff or just want to give up or whatever self doubt creeps in. Mm -hmm. uh, It takes a lot of work, but I, I also use that perspective in that I have this opportunity to do something. I can do something to give back A lot of people can't. Because they're, they're not, they're not this, aware they're of it. You're aware. They're not aware of it, or they're not yeah. in this position with it. They don't have the mm. finances. They don't have the time. Whatever it is, I have some of those things. So mm-hmm. I'm going to use it for something good, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and you're aware of that. That's, that's such a that's such an awesome thing. We didn't really even touch on Atmos Tree much, but yeah, I'd love to be involved in that and perpetuate that idea. I think it's a great idea. I've been trying Thanks, to think about how we can fold it into Rub's Edge and in 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 a similar format that that uh, you have it already with other companies. But we'll, we'll we'll figure that out. But but that's it, isn't it? It's perpetuating the good, and you know, just creating awareness and and that getting that kick of the can. Yeah. Right. And you don't have to do everything by yourself, I'm learning. You know, you can create a lot by yourself, but you mm-hmm. you need an army with you. So these podcasts create a tribe of people with you that are like minded and inspired mm-hmm. and then you can start to collaborate. Like I just going through my Instagram before we started this and I have people reaching out from uh somewhere down in the States and heard something and they kinda like they like the stuff that I'm posting, they like the stuff that I'm doing. And they're like, he's like, I used to be an arborist, I have all these hookups and whatever. He's like, I wanna help. I just wanna I I can't even tell you how many people are getting just reaching out yeah. saying they want to help they want to be part of it they want they well want to and, and that's that's an interesting like, thing this is great and i don't i don't want to get too far off or or interject on your on your on your wrap up here but but that's it you, you know the, those you really tap into the passions of people and they want to get involved and and be a part of a conversation right yeah and and that that is as well part of my motivation because people actually people do care you know they just haven't had a chance to be exposed to to the right information or knowledge um, yeah. or, or, you know, it was too much of a rush job. They just got to get it done. And now somebody's hurt or, you know, they weren't exposed to, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Tap into the passion. I like it. Sweet. Well, we'll do another podcast another time and maybe we can talk about more of that mindset stuff. Cause we both love that. I know we kind of stuck to more of a script today, you know, to mm-hmm. talk about what uh, rope access is, but, uh, maybe we can talk about, yeah, business and all that kind of stuff later on, but where mm-hmm. can, uh, people find you? Or contact you if they need to, or learn more, whatever. Yeah. Um, so Instagram is kind of been leading uh, the exposure for me. So that's at Ropes Edge. Um, ropes Edge is all one word, uh, just the words Ropes Edge. Uh, same on LinkedIn, uh, Ropes Edge uh, Equipment Co. On LinkedIn, uh, Facebook's the same Ropes. And I haven't been able to change this, but when I first started the company, Facebook was one of the first things that I opened, and I separated the words. So it's two words, Ropes. <laughs> edge that uh, not that it matters but that's all part of the branding i want to be consistent uh yeah. so ro- ropes edge basically pretty much everywhere and anywhere and then um ropes edge.ca sweet i love it well thanks dirk i really appreciate you coming on and uh giving us arborists a perspective of something that's similar but different no i appreciate the interest man in me specifically and of course in our industry you know um spread the love spread the knowledge um i appreciate it very much yeah Okay, right on, dude. I'm going to uh, hit stop. Don't hang up yet. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thanks, Cheers, everybody. Man. Take care. Chowder.